Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States. Episode 4.11, The Townsend Acts. By the time that 1667 rolled around, it had become abundantly clear in London that they had a serious problem on their hands. For the past several years, they had faced backlash from their American colonists towards measures to raise revenue in the colonies. This exploded outward publicly in 1765, as riots related to the Stamp Act consumed the colonies. Any hope that the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766 would be enough was soon quashed as well. In New York, colonists had entered into a tense standoff with the British officials over the question of quartering troops. Uprisings were occurring along the frontiers as well. All throughout the colonies, people were increasingly upset. During the debates on the Stamp Act, much of the opposition to repealing the Act warned that doing so would set a dangerous precedent. When Thomas Gage wrote to London warning that the colonists are moving towards independence, it does not seem to be mere hyperbole. This was a genuine concern that became all the more real when the end of the Stamp Act failed to bring the crisis to an end. Despite the best attempts of Benjamin Franklin to smooth the entire thing over, Nobody in Parliament could have felt good about the way things were going across the Atlantic. Now, in 1767, Parliament decided that once again they needed to attempt to establish their own supremacy over their recalcitrant colonies. As the North American colonies continued to simmer over the events of the past few years, the uproar in New York over the question of quartering troops had firmly established that the colonies were not going to just take their victory in the Stamp Act and acquiesce to London on all other matters. During our last episode, when I had left off, I had made a brief mention that you no longer needed to worry about Lord Rockingham. Sure enough, during the summer of 1766, the Rockingham ministry had indeed collapsed, leaving George III once again looking at the need for a new government. Although the king was not the biggest fan of William Pitt, he had few options. He was looking at the far more daunting idea of a return of a Grenville ministry, something that he had no interest in seeing realized. So, just like that, William Pitt was back in power. Now, some things had changed for Pitt. First, the man known as the Great Commoner was no longer a commoner. Pitt had accepted a spot in the peerage and became the Earl of Chatham. Suddenly, the great commoner would not be in the House of Commons, but would rather find himself leading the far less dynamic House of Lords. Now, before moving forward, a quick note on the nomenclature. Generally on the podcast, when somebody takes the jump up to the nobility, I have taken to calling them by their title. However, Because William Pitt has already been in our story for so long, I'm not going to go about confusing people who miss a minute of this episode and start referring to him as Chatham. So in this one instance, William Pitt will remain William Pitt. Among the men in the new government was the Duke of Grafton, who became the Minister of the Treasury, the Earl of Shelburne, who became the Secretary of State for the all-important Southern Department, which, if you will recall, included the North American colonies. Rounding out the new cabinet was Henry Conway as Secretary of State for the Northern Department, the Earl of Edgemont for the Head of the Admiralty, Lord Northington as President of the Council, and finally Lord Chancellor. Also, among this new ministry was the 41-year-old Charles Townsend, who was named the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Townsend was well-connected and had earned a reputation for being particularly ruthless and somewhat erratic. Townsend believed that the problem with the American colonies is that the local leadership was too influenced by the masses. He wanted to see a system whereby colonial officials had their pay guaranteed permanently. The logic behind this was that if the colonial leadership was guaranteed their pay, they would be under less control by the legislatures of the individual colonies and in turn would be more secure 
in performing their duties without fear of financial repercussions. Charles Townsend had long held views towards the colonies that surely would have been concerning to virtually everybody living in North America. Townsend had been in the government during the Seven Years' War and had personally seen how the colonists had responded to the call of arms. The image of colonial assemblies dragging their feet or otherwise just ignoring orders given by Braddock and Loudon was something that he was not soon going to forget. It also cannot be said that Townsend had not given clues as to these feelings prior to 1767. Recall when Colonel Barr had given his speech against the Stamp Act? Well, it was Charles Townsend that had challenged him, referring to the Americans as being children that the British had planted and cared for. In fairness to Townsend, while the guy certainly wanted to help regain control over the colonies, he is not the supervillain that he is going to be portrayed as in the near future. Townsend was among those who voted for the repeal of the Stamp Act, meaning that he was not simply locked in on some anti-American vendetta. Furthermore, it is not as though Townsend is out here acting unilaterally. There were a lot of people very worried about the American colonies heading into 1767. It was obvious to everybody by the end of 1766 that the repeal of the Stamp Act was not going to end the crisis. The real problem with Townsend is that the chaos in the ministry allowed him to act far more easily in opposition to the more American-leaning views of the rest of the cabinet. Townsend, in his plan to reform colonial policy, was quick to channel the spirit not only of Pitt, but of George Grenville. From a practical standpoint, the beginning of the Pitt ministry really did not radically change anything for the colonists. Pitt, like Grenville and Rockingham before him, understood the necessity of extracting revenue from the colonies. As the calendar turned over into 1767, the main debate fell to the question of the army that was to be put into North America, and more specifically, how to deal with the considerable costs that came along with it. Although the problem of figuring out this question nominally fell to Shelburne, it was Charles Townsend that would take the lead. Townsend agreed that the colonists needed to help pay the estimated £400,000 that the army would cost. However, unlike some of his rivals in Parliament, Townsend did not envision the colonists picking up the entire bill alone. Instead, he believed that the colonists should pay at least part of the cost. What he fell back on was the idea that there would not be any kind of real resistance. After all, the Declaratory Act had laid out that Parliament has the right to levy taxes on the colonies. Now, if you are sitting there thinking that, hey, William Pitt was pretty much the genius who won the Seven Years' War through his creative finances, of course, he will march in here and save the day. I honestly cannot blame you. However, in 1767, the William Pitt that we see bears zero resemblance to the William Pitt of the Seven Years' War. His ministry was filled with competing ministers while Pitt himself remained painfully aloof of, well, pretty much everything. Pitt may have been the prime minister and everybody fully recognized his very considerable abilities. Yet, despite this, Pitt mostly hangs around looking like a disinterested spectator. With his ministers bickering and fighting with each other, it was Charles Townsend who would benefit and gain power over the situation. With Townsend gaining power and support, it wound up being him who was in a stable enough position that he could propose his plan for what should be done with the troublesome American colonies. At the very core of everything was the fact that the Pitt Ministry, and those before it like Grenville and Rockingham, were interested in trying to extract more revenue out of the colonies. These acts that Townsend was putting forward, acts that would ultimately bear his name, sought to remind the colonies just who was in charge. So, what exactly were the acts that Townsend was proposing? There are three primary acts that were put forward, with a range of justifications behind them. The first act is one that we had introduced in our last episode when looking at the resistance to the Quartering Act in New York, 
and the subsequent British response. Nobody back in London was at all amused by the continued resistance of the New York Assembly over their refusal to get on board with the Quartering Act. In response to this, Townsend put forth the Restraining Act. The Restraining Act sought to punish New York for their resistance to the Quartering Act. It suspended the Assembly and held that acts passed by the New York Assembly were null and void moving forward, at least until New York got with the program in regards to quartering. Now, as inflammatory as this sounds on its face, it really is the one that we are going to spend the least amount of time talking about. Not because it is not important. It certainly was. However, as we discussed last time, the Restraining Act was never really enforced, largely because right around the time that this is being passed, the New York Assembly was busy, reluctantly, acquiescing to the demands of the Quartering Act. A second act sought to better streamline control over the colonial economy. This was going to be accomplished by forming up an American Board of Customs, which would oversee American trade and, hopefully, help make collecting duties much more efficient. Although it was not a popular act, this is also not going to be the one that everybody was going to focus on moving forward. The act that would once again reignite the entire situation was the Revenue Act. The Revenue Act, also known as the Duty Act, as its name suggests, followed in the footsteps of the Stamp Act and would seek to proactively raise money in the colonies. The target this time, rather than stamps, was glass, lead, paper, paints, and tea. These acts were never really going to bring in much actual revenue, which was perfectly fine because that was never really the point here. The point was to clearly prove that Parliament had the right to pass such taxes in the first place and hopefully open up the door for far more substantial revenue-raising models down the road. The act also accomplished the goal that Townsend had from the very beginning in shifting how colonial officials would be paid no longer would their salary come from the assemblies directly, meaning that should the assembly decide that they are not happy with said official, they could no longer use their salary as a bargaining chip. These acts combined to form the basis of the Townsend Acts. More than simply raising revenue, these acts were intended to remind the colonists of their place in the empire. If the question since the Glorious Revolution had been the colonists' place in the Greater British Empire, the Townsend Acts sought to provide a very unambiguous answer. It made everybody aware that the Declaratory Act was not mere puffery in an attempt to save face. Parliament was very serious when they made clear that they had the right to tax the colonies and pass any other laws that they saw fit. The acts would pass easily and were set up to go into effect in November of 1767. Interestingly, by the time that the Townsend Acts passed, Charles Townsend himself was no longer involved, having himself died suddenly in late September. Despite the loss of Townsend himself, there is little to be said about the passage of the Townsend Acts, because really, there was no meaningful debate over them. They passed with ease. The question here, though, is why? We are only a year past the repeal of the Stamp Act. The same people passing the Townsend Acts are those who had a year before argued in favor of repealing the Stamp Act. There are a whole lot of very questionable decisions that were made during the course of the imperial crisis. More than once, you have to shake your head at a British parliament that seems completely surprised by the reactions of the Americans, when it seems so obvious what those reactions were going to be. Now, of course, I am sitting here writing hundreds of years after the fact with the full benefit of hindsight. However, clearly in 1767, Parliament was acting with hindsight as well. They knew the outcome of the Stamp Act. They knew how vitriolic a response the colonies had. Why would Parliament decide, therefore, in 1767 to do something so obviously provocative? Was it a mere case of legislative myopia 
or had something else changed? Townsend argued that the colonists would not object to the new taxes being levied here, making the distinction that unlike the Stamp Act, these were not internal taxes, but were rather external. External taxes, if you'll recall, were duties that existed for the purpose of regulating trade, rather than raising revenue, whereas internal taxes were those intended specifically for the purpose of raising revenue. The money that the, admittedly modest, tax raised would be used to pay for royal officials stationed in the colonies. As we are going to see in a few minutes, the colonists, as it turns out, were not terribly concerned over the question of internal versus external taxation. All they saw was another unconstitutional attempt by the British to raise revenue from the colonists. In defense of Townsend, he had good reason to believe that the Americans here would be more amenable to paying his duties, as they were external rather than internal in nature. Such distinctions had been made by Benjamin Franklin himself during his speech to the House of Commons in 1766. He assured Parliament that the colonies were not objecting to the taxation, but rather to internal taxation. External taxation, such as we saw with the Sugar Act, would ultimately be accepted. As we are going to discuss, much as with his prediction of how the Stamp Act would be accepted, Franklin really did miss the mark here. Hollow justifications aside, the political environment within Britain had changed as well. The Stamp Act and its subsequent repeal had been a humiliating ordeal for the British. It was made all that much worse by the fact that the repeal had failed to quell the crisis. Despite orders from Parliament, the colonists were making no efforts at covering the losses of those whose property had been damaged or destroyed during the Stamp Act riots. In New York, the colonists had failed to fall in line with the Quartering Act. None of this had done much to endear the colonists to the British public nor their leadership. The colonists might have won the Stamp Act, but Parliament was anxious for an opportunity to put them back in their place, and now the public was behind them. By 1767, Benjamin Franklin was writing from London back to the colonies that the sentiment inside of Parliament and with the public was moving in a direction away from the colonial cause. Others saw the direction the winds were blowing as well. Thomas Hutchinson would later write that the revolution may as well have been dated to this point. Before we move on and talk about the reception of the Townsend duties in America, I want to spend just a moment specifically talking about tea. Spoiler alert here, but as some of you might have guessed, tea is going to become a pretty big point for us moving forward. So why was tea such a sticking point? We must always remember that the imperial crisis is not something that happened in a vacuum. While the ministry and parliament focused on the American colonies, they also had other issues coming up as well. Indeed, the real pressing issue at the same time was the struggling East India Company. The company had been mismanaged for years, and the government was very interested in bringing them back under control and, critically, cashing in on the potentially massive profit that the company generated. The biggest question had come from territory that the company itself was holding under its own control, specifically in Bengal. William Pitt argued that Bengal was really a British holding, considering that the company's conquest of the land was aided by the British army. The back and forth with the company over control was frustrating for Pitt, who, much as he had with the question regarding the American colonies, just kind of dipped out of negotiating with the company, leaving it instead to his other ministers. This is all going on at the same time that the issue over the colonies was being hotly debated. In that way, the two events, though seemingly unrelated on the surface, were tied into each other simply through timing. Really, in both the debates over the East India Company and the American colonies, the bedrock issue for the British was the same. Britain needed revenue, and here stood two potentially good sources of it. By placing those duties on tea, it was meant to help the East India Company 
in their trade with the colonies. The duty ensured that tea coming in from the East India Company was going to be cheaper than tea coming in from any other source. There is a lot more to this, of course, and down the road a bit when we reach the Tea Act of 1773, we are going to spend more time talking about the East India Company and American smuggling operations in particular. However, I wanted to go ahead today and begin laying the groundwork for why tea is going to become such a pressing issue. Based on what we know, it seems to follow that the passage of the Townsend Acts would lead to an explosion of anger in the colonies. Really, based on everything that we have seen happen so far this season, that would make sense. We know that basically from the moment that Patrick Henry had called out the Stamp Act in Virginia, the colonies had spent years in a state of ongoing resistance to British policy. This has manifested as protests to the Stamp Act and the Quartering Act, the burning of effigies, the riots that gripped the colonies during the summer of 65. Except that is not what happened. The colonists certainly were not happy with the Townsend Acts, yet their initial response lacked the vitriol of the Stamp Act. If the Stamp Act had been an explosion, then the reaction to the Townsend Acts should be considered to be more of a slow burn. This leaves us with a couple of questions that I want to address. First, why was the response so subdued as compared to the Stamp Act? Second, regardless of the energy behind it, I do want to discuss what that initial response actually was. Okay, so to start out, after spending the last several years blowing up over British policy, why did the colonists just give a collective shrug combined with some half-hearted fist-shaking? Since May 1765, the colonies had been living under extremely stressful conditions. There existed a legitimate crisis as the American colonists were forced to question their core relationship with the British crown. There had been upheavals, protests, the burning of effigies, and outright riots. By the time that the news of the Townsend Acts rolled into the colonies, a general exhaustion had settled in. It is critical at this point to understand what the colonial goals actually looked like. There is no evidence in 1767 or 68 that there was anything that resembled a meaningful independence movement. At this stage of the crisis, the American colonists were trying to reform imperial policy, or rather maintain the British approach to colonial matters that had existed since roughly the end of Queen Anne's War, and potentially back to the Glorious Revolution. What existed in the colonies, therefore, at this point, was a plan to reclaim what they felt they had lost in the past few years, and resist the perceived unconstitutional actions being taken by Parliament. This meant a coordinated resistance, which is what the last several years had produced. After years of resistance, however, there was a noticeable lack of energy in that initial response. The homes of colonial officials were not being torn to pieces by angry mobs. The initial response, therefore, moved in the direction of agreements between the merchants for non-importation. These agreements had proved powerful during the Stamp Act, and had indeed been the catalyst that ultimately pushed Parliament to back down and repeal the Act. It would once again be Boston leading the way here. News of the Townsend Acts had started filtering into New England during August of 1767. By the end of the summer, the Boston press was arguing that the merchants needed to step up and cut imports with the British. On October 28th, a town meeting in Boston took place, where the subject of non-importation was brought up and pushed forward. The meeting was led by James Otis Jr., and he was pushing a bill entitled to prevent the unnecessary importation of European commodities, which threatened the country with poverty and ruin. It is important to note here that what was being considered was broad in nature, and critically, not limited in language to what was being taxed under the Townsend Acts. Now, if you have been paying attention, you would probably assume that at this time, James Otis, the guy chairing the meeting, 
would have been a champion of the non-importation bill. However, as Otis enjoyed doing from time to time, he would take this very moment for an unexpected vacillation on the issue of the Townsend duties. Despite chairing the committee that was tasked with formulating a response, and himself having been so central to the events of years past, Otis shocked everybody, arguing that the Townsend duties were indeed constitutional. This is not the first time that Otis has decided to move unexpectedly, and it had very nearly cost him his seat a few years earlier. Otis is not going to stand in support of the Townsend Acts for very long, and indeed by the early part of 1768, he would shift himself towards the opposition. However, for now, Otis's arguments that the duties did not violate the rights of the colonists proved sufficient in Boston to have the town vote down the non-importation agreement. Rather than the far more broad-reaching plan that had been proposed, what was ultimately passed was a far more stripped-down version that called for reduced consumption of specific goods. If this sounds like it was lacking any real meaningful impact, you would be correct. Indeed, there was so little bite to what Boston had agreed to that the items specifically enumerated in the Townsend duties were not included in that list of items that they needed to reduce consumption of. In a bit of bad timing, the customs commissioners would arrive on Guy Fawkes Day, a day where everybody was seemingly looking for a reason for chaos. However, yet again, despite some loud protesting, there really was nothing else all that noteworthy about their arrival. Signs were displayed which declared liberty, property, and no commissioners. However, other than that and some muttering under their breath, there was little more in their response. By the end of 1767, there would be a push in small towns throughout New England, which would move towards agreements of non-consumption. However, while some 25 or so towns joined in on the movement, it was small enough that the overall effect was nominal at best. By the end of 1767, British officials were breathing a sigh of relief. Sure, there had been some pushback against the Townsend Acts, but all things considered, the situation really had not been that bad. Houses had not been destroyed, effigies had not been burnt, there was no rioting. Governor Bernard in Massachusetts would write about his considerable relief at the fact that calm had prevailed. The initial response to the Townsend duties had been surprisingly mild in comparison to what many were expecting. A mixture of exhaustion and confused messaging had really taken the bite out of that initial colonial response. In Boston, the center of the opposition to the Stamp Act, there had been little more than a toothless agreement to reduce consumption of certain items of little importance. Yet, already, things were changing. Despite the initial tepid response to the Townsend Acts, what we will ultimately find in the American colonies is more of a slow burn than anything else. The spark that was going to begin pushing the colonists towards action would come in a series of writings from the Pennsylvania attorney, John Dickinson. Letters from a Pennsylvania farmer would prove to be one of the most influential and important works during the imperial crisis. It had a wide-reaching impact and would be critical for the direction of the responses to the Townsend Acts moving forward. Next time, we are going to spend our time looking at the writings by Dickinson and discuss exactly what he was arguing for. In the wake of the letters from a Pennsylvania farmer, the colonists would slowly begin to shake off the collective malaise that had overcome them. As the colonists began to snap out of it, you can rest assured that that familiar knot in the stomach of men like Governor Bernard promptly returned. Until then, I hope you all have a fantastic two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and that you are staying safe. And I will see you all back here next time as we discuss John Dickinson's Letters from a Pennsylvania Farmer. <laughs>